and then total. Well, your turns happen when your velocity changes. So I've got three, I've got a, a couple of different portions of this. First, where did you start? So you start at S of zero, your original position, right? And so if you plug a zero back into your equation, this guy from the front, 3t squared minus 40.5t 40 squared, oops, plus 162t. That first one was cubed. If you plug a zero in there, you get zero, all right? If you go to where S is 3, your next division line, right? So you're accelerating this entire, or your velocity is positive this whole time. So go to where it's 3. That's like driving to Washington, D.C. there. S of 3, all right? Now, I already have these for the sake of time. Let's just plug them in. 202.5. And then you go to S of 6. Now, let me explain something about S of 6. You're going backwards here, right? You're actually reversing where you're going. It's kind of like coming back to where you started, except you're not going the whole way. So from 3 to 6, we need to find S of 6. Plug that in, you get 162. Remember, these are positions, right? And then S of 8, where did you stop? Well, that's 240. That, we found that out on the front as well. So we're going to look at total distances. To go from 0 miles to 202, let's say it's in miles, just because that makes it easier, to 202.5 miles, meters, inches, whatever you want to measure in, to go from 0 to 202.5, you actually traveled... 202.5, whatever units it's in. To go from 202.5 to 162.5, even though you're going backwards, or not 162.5, I'm sorry, just 162, I don't know where that came from. Uh, even though you are going backwards, you're still traveling distance, so your odometer on your car is still going to keep ticking on. The difference between these is 40.5. And then going from 162 to 240 is a distance of 78. Add up your total distances, and you get 321. So your total distance traveled is 321. So what this is going to be like is, uh, let's say you get from here to... Oh, I don't know, Kentucky. You're going to Washington, D.C. You get from here to Kentucky. And then in Kentucky, you realize, oh, no, I left something back in Oklahoma. So you got to go back to Oklahoma. And then you go back and pick up that something in Oklahoma, 40.5 units away. And then you go all the way back to Washington, D.C. There's your 240, which is where you needed to stop originally. Anyways. Okay, so total distance traveled. Remember, this is this is a always going to be a positive value, even when your velocity is negative. Total distance should always be positive. Distance is never ever ever negative. All right, last couple of questions here. On number five, it says tell where the object is accelerating and decelerating. So this one's pretty obvious. Where it's bigger than zero, it's accelerating. Where it's less than zero, it's decelerating. Talking about acceleration. So from the front here, a prime, or not a prime, but just a of t. Your acceleration, remember I'm, I already found that on the front. 18t minus 81. Right? It says it wants to know where the object is accelerating. So again, where's your division line? Where does it change from accelerating to decelerating, or vice versa? That happens when acceleration is zero. So set it to zero. All right. And we've got 18t minus 81 equals zero. So uh, take your 81 to the other side. You get 81 is 18t. Divide by 18. And just for the sake of time, once you divide by 18, you get t is equal to 4.5. All 
And again, had I given you units, you'd place your units there. We don't know if it's minutes, hours, seconds, whatever it is. So at time equals 4.5, your acceleration is zero. All right, well, let's think about that. If I plug in a number to the left of 4.5, like zero is an easy one. Remember, it goes from zero to eight. If you plug in a number to the left of 4.5, like zero, you're going to end up negative, right? 18 times zero is zero. Minus 81 is a negative value. What if you plug in a number to the right of 4.5, like 8, for example? 18 times 8 minus 81 is going to be very positive. All right. So what you've got is an acceleration that is increasing, or excuse me, not increasing, but it's negative to the left of 4.5 seconds, and it's positive to the right of 4.5 seconds. So you are uh, first decelerating here. So let's go in order. So it's... Uh, decelerating and that's happening between 0 and 4.5 and then you are accelerating from 4.5 to 8 remember I'm always stopping at 0 and 8 I don't want to go anywhere outside my time bounds because when you get outside of time, strange things start to happen. Strange and miraculous things. Number six. Describe when the object is slowing down or speeding up. Now, this is interesting. Speeds up when the velocity and acceleration have the same signs. And it slows down when velocity and acceleration have opposite signs. Good thing we've already done a sign analysis. Let's bring those guys over. V of t, here's 3, here's 6, A of t, here's 4.5. Right? We've already done a sign analysis here. We know this is positive, negative, positive, and negative, positive. So it speeds up, let's do speeds up first. It speeds up when the velocity and acceleration have the same signs. Okay, now when you're doing this, you're looking at where, uh, at what point do these things share a sign? So it could be positive or it could be negative. You could be speeding up in a negative direction. That's okay. So where do they have the same signs? Let's do negatives first. Velocity is negative between 3 and 6, and acceleration is negative between 0 and 4.5. So that means that it is speeding up and it's going to happen between 3 and 4.5 because that's where both of them are negative. From here to here, they're both negative, so it's 3 to 4.5. All right, and then where else do they have the same the same sign? Where are they positive? Velocity is positive uh, zero to three, but not for acceleration. Velocity is positive from six to eight, so it's positive in some of the same parts. How about six to eight? That includes acceleration as well, so six to eight. All right. And then slowing down here. Anywhere that they have opposite signs. So from 0 to 3, velocity is positive and acceleration is negative. So it'll go from 0 to 3. And then between 4.5 and 6, velocity is negative and acceleration is positive. So 4.5 to 6. So just a little bit of sign analysis for you. All right. Whoa, wrong button. Sorry, trying to brighten this up a little bit. And it's not working. Okay. So on number seven, I really like this question.
because there's not a lot of math involved. There's just a little logic. For what values of t is the average velocity equal to zero? Average velocity equals zero when the position function equals the starting position. Say what? When the position function, s of t, equals the starting position, well, how do you label your starting position? You started at time zero, so how about your position function when time is zero? So you need to figure out where does s of t become s of zero? Okay? Now, it's the average velocity, right? It's going to go back to this guy. I'm going to flip over the front here. When it says average, it's talking about secants. So I need to find delta y over delta x. In this case, change in distance over change in time. You've known that velocity is distance over time, right? Now we're getting into some actual physics stuff. So your average velocity is equal to the change in distance over the change in time. Now the change in distance, since my position function is s, it's going to be the change in s over the change in t. Alright, now really, really, really think about this. You're trying to find out when your average velocity equals zero, right? So here's the formula for average velocity. Let's set it to zero. And how do you find the change in s? It's going to go from where you start, or excuse me, where you uh, stopped at to where, from where you started at. Now, you could stop at any point, right? It's the average velocity. So your position comes from s of t, and you are subtracting where you started, s of 0. Right? Now what this is doing is just showing you algebraically how I came up with this. And then for time, it's whatever your time is minus your initial time, t of 0, t sub 0, rather. If you multiply this guy over here, your denominator is going to go away. So you've got s of t minus s of 0 equals 0. Bring your s of 0 over equals s of t. Again, all it's saying is what um, it's basically just restating this, what I came up with just in my noggin. All right, so we have algebraic proof. Here's what we're doing. Now, if you actually go through and you actually set this thing, 3t cubed minus 40.5t squared plus 162t, if you actually set that equal to 0, I came up with a graph here. Let me show you what that looks like. So what I've done is I've gone to my calculator and I've plugged in that value. 3x cubed minus 40.5x squared plus 162x. And on my window, my time is 0 to 8 seconds or 8 minutes or 8 hours, whatever it is. Right? And then on my uh, maximums and minimums, well, I know I hit... 240 at the end, I think it was, 240, so I just went up to 300. You could have gone up to 250 or whatever you want. What I'm looking for is where will this thing cross the x-axis? Where will it become zero? And in this case, there's nary a point. At no point will this thing become zero. All right? So because this thing will not have, will not hit zero, I'm going to write... Um, you can say at no time, uh, at no x value, or no, at no values of t, however you want to say it. Um, I'll say at no time will the average velocity equal zero. At no time will average velocity equal zero. What you're doing here, again, is you are setting your function to zero and you're trying to find the average velocity. At no time will average velocity equal zero. Okay, Dave. Have a good one.